Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, so we are back today uh, with a section on attention and uh, to start this session, uh, we will do a quick recap of what we did in the last lecture and from there on we will continue uh, with the today's lecture. So, in the last lecture what we focused on or what we did was we looked at what is attention, what does it really mean. And we also looked at the various factors which control attention uh, and uh, the various theories of what attention is. So, a quick uh, recap onto the concepts uh, which we discussed in the last class. So, attention basically is a filter, it is a process or it is a mechanism of the brain uh, which lets the brain control the kind of stimuli. Uh, which is impinging onto uh, uh, the brain from the sensory organs. And attention is very beneficial because attention uh, limits the capacity of the mental resources which uh, should be diverted to uh, various cognitive processes which are taking place in the brain. So, basically attention is an important uh, factor. Now, the question that we asked in the last class was whether attention uh, can be increased or whether there is something called diverted attention. So, with practice whether we can use the attentional capacity that we have on different tasks. And as an answer to that we saw that as we practice more and more what we get is that we can divert our attention and this is called divided attention. We can use our resources mental resources on several activities. So, basically while doing one job we can also put our attention onto other job and this basically when we are able to divide attention to several other uh, jobs to a number of jobs, then some of the jobs uh, which are less important which are routine becomes automatic and the ones on which we are focusing attention presently is the one which is at the attentional uh, system which is at the center of attention. Another interesting thing which we saw was that attention is basically a mechanism which fluctuates. So, attention basically keeps on fluctuating from uh, uh, moment to moment. There is something called attention span which uh, basically defines uh, for how long attention would be put onto something or for how long attention is being captured. Now, in addition to that we saw something called selective attention which is basically focusing on attention onto something. Uh, specific, how do we focus our attention onto specific things and look into specific things which is basically equivalent to something called mental con concentration. In addition to this we also looked at a couple of theories. So, brief review of the theories we looked at something called filter theory which defines uh, the fact that on filter theory says that only uh, those processes only those stimuli uh, which on which we focus our attention to are processed and other stimuli are not processed. So, uh, our focus of attention decides what stimuli proce gets processed and what stimuli does not. In addition to that it also points out that some features of the unprocessed stimuli are processed, but these are physical features and so nothing of much value. And so, uh, this there was an experimentation done by Cherry using something called dichotic listening task to prove uh, how attention should be studied. And later on, uh, Anna Tresman went ahead and challenged the filter theory. Uh, why? Because Moray came up with the idea of something called cocktail party phenomena, and he was able to show that some materials from the unintended ear or from un, uh, from 
uh, those processes which are not attended to could also pass for example, somebody's name. And so, Anna Tresman uh, came up and gave her, gave her uh, theory of attenuation theory which says that attention basically what attention does it does not filter out things, but it attenuates or volume downs uh, the uh, material which is attended which is unattended which we are not putting our attention to and if needed we can actually go ahead and process that. In addition to that, we also looked at uh, something called uh, the late selection theory, where we looked at uh, the bottleneck, which was defined by uh, the filter theory, which exists right at the beginning of an incoming message, now shapes toward the back of the message, which basically means that most messages uh, goes ahead and are processed for meaning for some level of meaning not all level of meaning, but seven level of meaning and depending on uh, uh, the kind of processing that, that, that you require kind of processing being, being uh, happening uh, or the kind of differentiation that you want the, the place at which the differentiation happens the messages are processed. What I mean by this is that at what level two messages differ will decide to what extent messages are processed. So, let us continue with uh, our discussion and focus on to or look into a new theory of attention, which is called the multimodal theory of attention. So, it is a very brief theory, it is a very uh, short theory, which was proposed by someone called Johnston and Hines in 1978 and it is called the multimodal theory of attention. And what they say is attention is actually a very flexible system, which allows for the selection of message over others. And this selection of message or this filtration of message uh, from the incoming stimuli happens at three stages. Uh, so, uh, most of the messages pass through stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 of uh, uh, processing. If the message is filtered at stage 1, it is called early selection, when a message is filtered at stage 3, it is a late selection. Now, so how is this theory a little bit different? The only thing which is different in this theory is uh, the variables which control stage 1 or which direct stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3, which basically describe stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. And as you can see, stage 1 is sensory representations, where the sensory representation is constructed. So, if a message is processed early on, it is processed at the level of the representation, which the message is creating onto the neural structure. So, if the representation itself and so basically it will be physical properties of the message which makes us uh, apply the attentional filter or which directs the uh, attentional filter for processing here. If both the messages or a number of messages are approaching us or the incoming stimuli has a number of messages different messages which are very similar in terms of the physical property then they can they more or less have the same kind of representations. So, how are they processed? In this case, the message are differentiated, the filter is applied based on the semantic representations of the message. So, at the level of meaning. So, what this theory goes ahead and says is that most messages which differ. So, the first uh, factor which is used for processing messages for separating messages uh, by the attentional filter happens at the level of the physical stimulus or at the level of the representation itself. And as you know that sensory representations are generally the con composed of the physical features. These are the first features or these are the first representations which are made onto the brain or the mind. Now, uh, in the second step if messages which are approach are of more or less same kind, a meaning wise differentiation happens, a separation of messages is done in terms of what the meaning of the message is. A fact where most messages or two messages have the same meaning or nearly same meaning and they have the same uh, uh, kind of physical features, what happens then? In those cases, a deeper level analysis, a deeper level of uh, uh, filtration, a deeper level of attentional processes really work and here the separation or the filter is dependent on both the semantic and uh, sensory representation uh, uh, into takes, takes care of or it takes uh, includes both the semantic representation and uh, the sensory representation. So, if 
most messages are similar in terms of outwardly uh, similar physical features and semantic uh, semantic meaning then a third level of analysis where happens it's a deeper level of analysis is a deeper level of filtration where very very minutely the sensory features are looked into and the semantic features are looked into and in combination the sensory features and the semantic features are in combination with each other are then become the basis or differentiation of two messages. So, this is what the theory is and this is a very simple theory of Heinz and Johnston. The next theory that we talk about is Daniel Kahneman's theory. Now, even before we go ahead and look at Daniel Kahneman's theory of uh, how attention really works, let us talk about attention the, and the capacity of attentional systems and the mental effort which is required for uh, moving or uh, using attention. So, most psychologists are actually looking at uh, in terms of attention those messages, the factors which make a message being processed or what makes what factors of a message makes something being processed and they are not looking at those factors which are not making a message being processed. To make it more simple uh, since in attentional uh, in attentional theory or in terms of an attentional experiment uh, most psychologists are now uh, focusing on the fact that what makes a message being selected for processing. So, they are not looking at those factors which which makes a message not get processed, but they are looking at those factors which make a message being processed and they believe most psychologists nowadays believe that looking at those factors which uh, basically uh, uh, give this idea of how something is being processed or what is the way in, in which something is processed that should be uh, that should be the, the the center of attention of uh, atten attentional studies or center of focus of attentional uh, studies. Now, one particular experiment or one particular view uh, which uh, defines how attentional focus or uh, what is the capacity of attention is the viewpoint of those theorists which look as uh, look at attention as a spotlight. So, a group of theorists believe that attention is like a spotlight on a stage and so what is this uh, center of the stage is what focuses attention and what they believe is that most spotlights that that is there on a stage or on any particular uh, area the spotlights have fuzzy boundaries. It basically means that part of messages which are towards the boundary of the spotlight also gets processed. Now, Daniel Kahneman he gave a very interesting theory of uh, uh, attention where he used something called uh, things like allocation policy, things like user disposition, things like uh, physical states and so many other things or so many other factors are defining how attention, uh, real attention filter really works or how the process of attention really works. And so, what Daniel Kahneman says is that attention is a set of cognitive processes which is used for categorizing and recognizing stimulus. So, Kahneman proposes a model which views attention as cognitive process which helps in making categories, in making categories of the incoming stimulus or taking incoming stimulus and assigning them into pre-recognized category and why doing this? Because this helps in the recognition or in the identification of the stimuli. What he believes is the more complex a stimuli and incoming stimuli is the more mental resources is needed. The lesser complex an, inter, in, an internal stim, uh, an external stimuli is the lesser the attentional resources are needed. So, essentially this model then depicts the allocation of mental resources to various cognitive tasks. Now, if on the right hand side you actually see the model itself of how uh, this Kahneman's model really works. Now, as let us decipher this model a little bit and see how this model really works. Now, as you see what Kahneman believes is that there are a number of mysterious determinants in the environment which decides whether a message is processed or whether uh, a message should be processed or not. And this miscellaneous determinants are something which is physical in nature and this comprises the physical property of any incoming messages. But once a message enters into or impinges on our sense organs, it is the level of arousal which decides uh, whether a particular message will be 
uh, will be attended to or not. So, basically the first and important factor in his theory Daniel Kahneman's theory of uh, attention is the level of arousal. And we have seen this level of arousal also in previous theories which says that level of arousal is an important factor which determines whether a message gets processed or not. And so, what Daniel Kahneman says is that with high levels of alertness, high levels of arousal, the chances of uh, uh, processing, the chances of um, attentional filter working is very high. Also, he says that not only the, uh, the arousal levels, but also the available capacity. How much capacity of or how much mental concentration is left that defines how the filter will work. If a very less mental capacity is available, if most of the mental capacity is taken up, then the attentional filter will not work as required and so as uh, wanted. But then if the available capacity is high and the arousal is less, the filter works perfectly or the these are the terms on which the filter actually works. And Another factor, an interesting factor which defines the functioning of the attentional system or the attentional filter is the evaluation of demands on the capacity. How much demand is being made on the attentional capacity? If some other jobs uh, or most jobs which are happening with the new incoming stimuli which needs to be filtered are automatic in nature if the if the eval if the demand on the attentional capacity or the attentional resource is less then an effective filter will work or the filter working will be effective but if a second job which is given to you or the uh, secondary job that you are doing in addition to uh, focusing your attention onto something new, what would really happen is that both jobs will compete with each other and lesser attention is required and the chances are the filter will block the new message or block the important, uh, 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 important contents of the message. Also, in addition to the arousal and the available capacity, the allocation policy is important uh, term for uh, Daniel Kahneman's theory. Now, what is allocation policy? According to Daniel, Daniel Kahneman, allocation policy in the model is affected by individuals in, in daring dispositions and momentary in, intentions and the evaluation of demands on mental capacity. So, what he says is the, the way, the kind of uh, uh, system that we use for allocating or for distributing mental concentration or mental effort onto different tasks depends upon three things. One is the enduring disposition, it is like the interest. So, if a person is interested in something, he is bound to put much attention to that particular thing and bound to put lesser attention to other things. So, if somebody is doing something interesting, chances are that a lot of his attention policy would be allocated to that job and very less of attention is left over. But if somebody is doing a boring job, a job which uh, which um, uh, which uh, is not of interest to you and which is not uh, something which you endure, it is not an enduring disposition, something not of your liking, what would happen is that you would uh, basically most of your attentional, uh, attentional system is available, resources are available and so what would happen is that most of the uh, since it is available, it can be it can be made to use. Also of interest are momentary intentions. Now, momentary intentions is things which happens at the moment. So, at the time of processing, at the time of when attentional filter really works, when something is a new stimuli comes in, what happens then? So, if, if the task demands are something or if at the time of processing an event occurs which requires you to focus yourself onto something else, onto some, some other event or some other job or uh, some other uh, ev uh, some other a feature of a stimuli and those reasons or those things could be also responsible for our allocation of how much allocation you can do or mental resources to a particular uh, event incoming stimuli. And so, this how much uh, demand is being made, how much of the processing is going on presently, what are your likes and dislikes and what is the momentary intention, these, these, these factors will define how a person will define or will divide his attention. So, basically looking at it, the first factor which basically decides whether attention would be paid to something or not is basically somebody's or a person's arousal level and available capacity, whether the person is aroused enough and whether he has a, a, a huge or 
not if not huge, but a, a substantial amount of available cognitive resources. If the resources are pre used in something is being used in something, then the person will not attend to any new messages or will not at, uh, attention will not come into play. Given the fact that the enough attentional uh, capacity is available and enough arousal is there or more than maximum level of arousals and attentional capacity is available. Even then, your attention onto a particular job will depend on the allocation policy of how things are being allocated and or how somebody wants to allocate that or how somebody wants to put their attention onto something. And this will depend upon your likingness and liking uh, un unlikingness of some things, your motivations towards a particular job or towards a particular uh, uh, event which is happening at the present. Also on what happens now? So, some sudden event might occur which might take up uh, a lot of your attention. So, uh, think of yourself counting notes in, in a bank or people counting uh, bank tellers counting notes and a sudden loud bang comes in. Now, when a sudden a loud bang comes in or sudden loud bang happens, it is very difficult for the person who is doing this job of counting the notes to focus on to it and his attention will save. So, momentary intentions are those things which happen in the moment and so those are those demands of those environmental demands or those movement demands which shift attention. Other thing of interest are the evaluation of demands on the available capacity. So, how much demand is right now? So, how much task are you doing in addition to the present task which is in hand and these will decide all possible activities that somebody can actually go ahead and do. So, your allocation uh, policies will decide how much attention you will put to something and how much attention you are going to put on to something else and this finally, will decide the responses. So, basically this theory goes ahead and says that attention depends not only on arousal and available capacity, it also depends upon people's motivations, liking and unlikings, momentary features and the de current demand on a particular uh, uh, current demand on a, uh, on a particular system or on a particular processing which happen. The next theory that we look into is something called the schema theory of uh, attention. And so, this is a very interesting theory of attention because this is a totally uh, different view of attention. And so, what this theory actually goes ahead and says. So, this theory was first of all proposed by someone called Ludwig Neisser in the year 1976 and this is called the schema theory. So, what is this theory actually goes ahead and says? It is a very interesting theory, a very interesting approach which says that people's attention does not go ahead and filter or unfilter something. So, people's attention is not a process which actually uh, separates things which gets filtered through it and something which does not get filtered to it. What he says is that things which are not filtered, things which we do not put, uh, put our attention on to, we actually do not go ahead and perceive it anyway. So, basically what this theory so, uh, says is that the schema theory says is that only those things which we focus our attention to are perceived, but those things which we would not focus our attention to are not perceived at all, it is not taken in at all. And so, attention system does not work like uh, uh, if, uh, in, in or uh, if then kind of a system, but it works as all or none kind of a system. So, if every so if attention systems basically decide if everything is processed and whatever is not processed is left over and nothing no kind of uh, uh, even or no kind of uh, mental resources are allocated to it. Now, what he says is that uh, attention the process of attention is more or less like apple picking from trees, it is like pe uh, picking messages from trees. So, when he says that when we go apple picking think about we go picking mangoes or apples from trees the ones that we pick are the ones which are available to us and the ones that we do not see remain on the tree. And similar to that schema theory basically says that the one message the messages that we put our attention on to are the only ones that we should be interested in or that we care about. The ones that we do not look into that we do not pay our attention to that we do not focus on to are actually remain outside the system and there are no clues or there are you know, there, there is no way to basically go ahead and process them. To prove that this kind of approach is true that what we do not process or the, what we are not paying attention to uh, is not processed at all. To, to look at a system like this, Nicer and Blacken conducted an experiment in 1975 to uh, provide evidence to this theory. So, it is a very simple experiment which was done. 
Now, there were two different videos which were shown to a group of subjects. On the first video, you see people are hand slapping. So, this is the first video in which you uh, the subjects in the experiment saw people hand slapping and they had to count the number of hand slappings. And so, this is an easy job to do and people were able to count the number of hand slaps which were being made. On the second video, people went ahead and saw the number of ball passes which were happening uh, between people. So, there are three people who are playing a ball and a number of ball passes are happening and so the job of the subject or the person who is taking part in the experiment is to ca count the number of passes which the ball is making from one person to another or the number of hand passes that is being uh, happening. So, both easy jobs to do and so people were able to do them. A third video was um, uh, made where people were made to look into this video and that is what, what this video had is a superimposed image. So, both the videos were superimposed onto one another and so people were actually asked to uh, shadow one of these videos. The video that they had to shadow was the one which is ball passing. So, now what has happened is a third video is presented. So, in video 1 you count the number of hand passes sorry uh, the number of uh, hand slappings which is there and number 2 you uh, look at the number of ball passes and in number 3 what you tend to do is the uh, in the superimposed video you actually have to shadow you actually have to read aloud or tell allowed how many ball passes are there. So, so, there are two images there are two superimposed videos there on one you have ball, the hand slapping going on on, on the other you have the uh, ball passing going on. And so, what really happens then is that people are since people are focused to uh, put their put their mind onto the hand passes people do not really pay attention to what is happening in the hand slapping experiment. And soon enough Few five minutes into the video, the people who are hand slapping actually stopped doing that and starting pass and started passing balls to each other. But it people, most people, most experimenters, actually 80 percent of the people who view these videos were not able to recognize how this or when does this switch happens. They don't realize that people who were doing this hand slapping, this change to ball throwing this kind of thing was not noticed. And so, this video and even when uh, the experiment ended and a brief uh, recap, a brief overview of the video was uh, uh, overview of what they saw in the video was taken, 80 to 85 percent people were not able to tell whether uh, this hand slapping video in the hand slapping video the change happened in terms of people stopped hand slapping and started throwing balls, which basically provides evidence to the fact that, that attention could be a system which is an uh, if an, uh, an all or non kind of a system where what you perceive is what you perceive and what you do not perceive actually does not get into the system at all. Now, similar to the uh, study uh, done by Neisser and Beckpin, uh, an interesting fact which is obvious or which is uh, uh, present in our environment is something called inattentional blindness. Now, inattentional blindness is basically a phenomena where things in front of us we do not see it. Now, often most of you would have had a scenario in which a thing you are looking for is just in front of you and you do not see it. And this particular phenomena is called inattentional blindness and this is basically even if something is in front of you, you do not see it. And so, this provides inattentional blindness provides support to the schema theory. So, to study inattentional blindness two kind of experiments were done. In one experiments people were passing ball among each other and so there were 40 hand passes of ball which were there at the rate of 40 hand passes per minute. And so, most subjects were advised to actually go ahead and count the number of hand passes. And so, people actually engorged onto that and so they looked at the number of hand passes which were happening. So, look at video this and video this and so in, <coughs> in this week people look at a number of hand passes which were actually going along and they very equally or very nicely were able to count the number of passes that the ball made from one object to another. Now, hidden from the subjects attention were two events which most subjects actually did not notice only 20 percent to 25, 25 percent people actually went ahead and knew that this happened, this event happened. So, within this scenario of ball passing, in one case a person 
carrying an umbrella came in between these ball passes or came in. So, look at this person, this person I am talking to, he came in between and he passed these people whose hand passing. Similarly, in one case a woman, a short woman wearing the dress of a bear came in and passed this particular thing. So, if, if you want uh, you can actually go ahead and see this video of inattentional blindness, it is available on YouTube and you can see that when engrossed, when somebody is engrossed onto a job and when a, a, a difficult job like this, for example, how many hand passes are being taken place, count the number of uh, males who are passing the ball and count the number of females from uh, whom the ball is passing and if this kind of task load is put onto your attentional system, is put onto your processing system, what happens is people now not able to focus on on stimuli which is just in front of them as you see that these two stimuli these two people are the bare clad lady and here the umbrella taking man passed in front of people's eye, but they were not able to recognize this, they were not able to see this. The reason is that as more and more load are put is put into the attentional system, you do not process things in front of you. We basically suppose uh, partly the schema theory that what you process that if you do not process something it is like apple picking. So, what, what you do not process remains out of the system, what you process is what remains in the system. So, an interesting ex experiment to support schema theory. Now, the question that we had at the beginning of this section was this if attention is such a hard thing to look at, whether there is something called automaticity, whether there is something called automatic processes, is there a fact that if attention can become automatic, is there a fact that uh, can attention become automatic is, and if it becomes automatic with practice, can systems become automatic, can pro human processing or mental processing become automatic, so that more attention is available for other jobs. Now, we have seen that this is possible because more learned drivers with a lot of practice can divert their attention to multiple other things, for example, talking, listening to music and so on and so forth. So, we will look at uh, to that feature of attention uh, and that feature is that with a number of practice, with a lot of practice most jobs become automatic in nature and so attention is freed up, the attentional capacity is freed up. So, as we become well practiced, as we become well practiced doing something uh, that takes less of our attention to perform. A good example is typing as I said. So, as you have been typing on your keyboards for a lot of time, for a lot of years and so you realize that as you, have, as you practice, as you learn this typing skill more and more, what really happens is that things become automatic, it becomes the processing becomes automatic and so while typing uh, earlier when you uh, when when you were learning typing you have to find out where the q w e r t word is where the f and d word is the switch and all those kind of things but when as soon as you develop this habit or you start or you practiced more now more attention is available now you can type talk to people drink coffee and do a lot of other jobs at hand so basically typing has become a lot of uh, is a good example of how automaticity with practice attention becomes attentional spans is freed up and jobs become cognitive jobs becomes automatic in nature. So, if one is skilled at typing, he can carry out fairly uh, uh, accurate amount of uh, information and uh, jobs quickly and carry out a conversation as I, I just said. So, what affects the capacity of any task at or capacity any given task require? What is the reason or what are the factors which affect the capacity of uh, uh, any task is going to require? The answer to the above question are two factors one is task difficulty. Now, the more difficult a, ta uh, a task is, the more attentional capacity it will require and the more time it will require uh, for you to uh, finish this task. So, uh, for example, if a simple counting task is given to you, a number counting task is given to you or if a simple um, uh, 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 count, counting of money is given to you, it is a simple job and does not require too much attention. But if I load your memory with other uh, demands, for example, not only the fact that, so I give you a bunch of notes to count, let us say all of them are 100 rupees notes and so you go ahead and count. And so if the task demand is just counting the number of uh, 100 rupee notes is an easy task. But then suppose I say that this uh, job of counting uh, the money 
uh, you have to do th two things you have to not only tell me how many nodes are there, but also tell me which of the nodes are forward facing and which of the nodes are reverse facing, which means that I have nodes in the bundle which are on uh, which are forward facing which has the uh, front side up or the back side up. Now, the task becomes little bit complex and requires more of attention and similarly, I can ask you several other other load your memory or working capacity with several other facts and so as task capacity increases, the task difficulty increases, the capacity required is more or more more, uh, more and more in, 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 in uh, uh, demand. So, the de demand of attentional capacity becomes high and individual's familiarity with the task. So, the second factor which decides the capacity any task is going to require is the individual's familiarity with the task. Now, individuals who are very familiar with a particular task who know what a task uh, looks like or what is the requirement of a task, they are able to do a task very nicely and very easily in comparison to those individuals who uh, do not know a task. For example, look at bank tellers. Now, bank tellers are very familiar with this counting task with they know how to count and they know a lot of other things about uh, the counting, how the note looks like, what is the crispiness of the note, the motor memory which means the, the hand memory of counting is better and so they can do this job easily. But if you take these people, the same people and into some other job, it is very difficult to them to pay attention. Look at coders, people like uh, uh, in our institute, people, uh, uh, students who do coding. Now, when they are doing coding, they are very familiar with the coding job and it is in a particular language, let us say somebody is learning C, he is very familiar with that and coding is easy for him. But if he moves from one language to the other language or tries to do something else uh, in terms of data mining or something else, in those cases, in, a, in a unfamiliar territory, it becomes really uh, difficult. So, individual's familiarity, how much familiar you are with a particular task decides how much uh, 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 effort or how much capacity of attention you will require. And so, two important factors that I discussed now is task difficulty and the individual's familiarity with the task. So, practice generally is believed to decrease the amount of mental effort a task requires and makes this automatic. So, as I discussed uh, uh, briefly with you that the more and more of practices that you do, the more familiar we you get with a particular task, the more easy it becomes for you to do the task and the more automatic it becomes. The more automatic a task becomes, uh, the more aut uh, automatic many tasks become, the more easier your life is. Think of your daily routine, now, if your daily routine, if you look into right from getting up in the morning to coming to the uh, to the mess for having food, coming to uh, the place of study which is the lecture theatres in our institute and similarly and riding a bicycle or basic processes which are there, all of these are automatic. Right, you do not have to put too much mental concentration into it. You do not have to each day think about how to ride a bicycle or what should I do in riding a bicycle or how do I eat my food. You do not even uh, people who walk here do not even have to think how, how and why my foot is pushing the, uh, how do I walk or pushing the uh, earth down and that makes me walking. They also do not have to think about simple task of going or uh, uh, brushing or this kind of job, these are fairly automatic. And if you ask these people, these students or oh, what happened today, what kind of food you have, most people do not even realize what kind of food you have, it is an automatic process. Yes, but then this with practice, now why has this become automatic is that they do this routinely, they do these tasks routinely over and over again 365 days a year and so it becomes more and more automatic. Automaticity actually states, uh, it, it goes ahead and saves your mental concentration. So, you can put this concentration, to, so that you can put this attention to other jobs which is of interest and so you can or other jobs which is more demanding and you can put your attention. So, if students are get engrossed into basic things like what food they eat or how the cycle bicycle works or how do they brush and those kind of daily activities, they will not be left with mental concentration to read, to understand lectures, to understand what is happening here. And so, this uh, practice making automation is an important fact. Remember that as you practice more and more, more of your attentional system becomes free and becomes available to put into uh, tasks which require it. So, uh, a very interesting task or a very interesting experiment which goes ahead and proves uh, that uh, automaticity or being automatic 
and doing things uh, uh, with practice the uh, jobs become automatic or as you practice more and more a task more and more uh, more attentional system or more attentional resources are available and this availability of more resources makes makes you focus on to other jobs. So, which basically means that the more practice you do the more automaticity becomes and more attentional resources are available. And so, a task which was defined which is called the stroop task now it is a very very interesting task. So, let us do this task and see how does it really work and in the later half in the in the end of this task I will also go ahead and show you uh, 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 the meaning of how this task really works. So, John's uh, Ridley Stroop in 1935 uh, made a famous demonstration to prove that automaticity is basically the reason uh, uh, of or it is it's a byproduct of practice and automaticity frees up a lot of attention. So, let us do the task I will give you some uh, couple of minutes to uh, go ahead and do the task. So, basically focus on to your screen and start doing what I am asking you to do. So, uh, this is a demonstration of uh, the Stroop task. So, look at this demonstration. What you have to do is state the color as fast as possible. So, I will give you one minute to basically uh, do this task uh, uh, self task of this and look at this uh, three rows and uh, quickly name this color or quickly go ahead and uh, name this color and write it if possible somewhere. So, uh, look at this demonstration and name the color. Now, I am pretty sure most of you would have accurately named the color bars which are presented here. And so, we move up to the next part of this demonstration where I will give you around about 30 seconds to 45 seconds to finish this task. So, in the demonstration 2 what you really have to do is state the colors as fast as you can just read what is the colors which has been written, written on this demonstration just go ahead and read the colors. So, do that and I will give you 30 seconds for doing it. Okay, so, I given enough time to read the colors and now we will shift to the third demonstration, but a word of advice in the third demonstration you have to do the thing that I am asking you to do as fast as possible. So, do not cheat basically what you need to do is to take enough uh, as fast as possible uh, the job which is being given to you. And so, what you have to do in the third demonstration is to name listen very carefully to name the color of the ink color of the ink in which the particular word is written. So, all you have to do is to go ahead and name the color of the ink the ink the color of the ink in which it is written. So, I will present to you and I will give you a uh, 30 second period to do uh, as uh, uh, this job. So, let us turn to it. What you have to do is to name the color of the ink in which state the colors of the ink in which this was have been written. So, let us start. So, I hope most of you would have completed and did you see what happened? What really happened is that most people actually are not able to correctly identify the color of the ink in which this particular word is written. The reason is that red is written in green and so most people tend to read red instead of green which is what the correct answer was or for example, here you see that blue is written in yellow. So, when given a task of reading as fast as possible what you see you will read blue here, but not the question was the thing that I asked you to do was to name the color of the ink. So, your response here should have been yellow and similarly here the response should have been uh, uh, red not green and in this case the response should be blue not yellow. Now, why does this happen? Why is it difficult uh, for you to, to name the color of the ink? Uh, in, instead of which you can very fast tell me what the uh, what the uh, display uh, what are the things are written or the what are the words written in the display. What do you think happened? What is the reason why this happened? And another question if given enough practice can people lower the time of response here. So, if enough time is given can people do this task fast? So, let us find the answer. Now, Stoops task presents with a series of color bar as I said in red blue green or color word painted on conflicting colors and people have to name the color of the ink. 
but then as I said most people are not able to perform the Stroop task according to Stroop why this happened is that adults or literate participants have so much practice reading the task uh, requires the attend that the task requires little attention and is performed rapidly. Now, since as literates we are so familiar, so familiar with reading, we have so much practice with reading that it is difficult not to read and so when the question asks is to read to basically name the color of the ink, it becomes a difficult job. Why does it become a difficult job? It becomes a difficult job because reading is natural to us, it is something which we know and so the first response our system, so we have so much practice with it that the first response our cognitive system does is read the letters and that is why you cannot name the uh, uh, color of the ink. But then what really happens is that with practice this could be reduced. So, if I give this task to you uh, let us say for 5 days and if you practice 20 times on 5 days then the amount of time it takes for you to read the color of the ink becomes easy. And so, thus this become this conference with the item consisting of word pairs and now this type of response one that take little attention and effort is called automatic. And so, on a funny cartoon on the right hand side you can see that obviously dogs do not see it, but then this puppy is saying to the other uh, puppy that see for some reasons you may find this Stroop stars really tricky. They, they cannot believe their eyes, they do not do not believe that humans are so stupid because you know dogs cannot talk and so when dogs cannot talk it is very easy for them. Also people who are not literate, people who have very literacy less, less literacy who are not familiar with the learning paradigm it is very easy for them to do this job. Only for people who are literate, people who have enough uh, uh, literacy or people who have enough practice with reading it becomes difficult for them. Now an interesting thing that I want to bring in here is whether the neural structure responds to attention. So, whether there are something called uh, neurophysiological evidences of attention. So, basically what I mean here is that in the beginning of this uh, lecture I told you, I said to you that we will be looking at not only how the cognitive processes work or what is the reason of how the mind works, we will also look at something called the brain responses to it. So, uh, in the earlier experiments, in the earlier part of this chapter, we have looked at that attended years uh, produce uh, 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 things from attended years are pr uh, processed more than from the unattended years. So, unattended materials or stimuli from the unattended ear is uh, either toned down or not processed at all or not picked up at all and there are several theories which go ahead and say that attended ears differ from unattended ear in terms of how much is processed. So, what we want to see is whether there is an ERP marker where there is a brain response to this whether this is true at the level of the brain and so someone called Banish, Banish I am sorry in 1997 he studied or he uh, designed an experiment to study how does the ERP markers of the attended and unattended years in Cherry's experiment. I would say modified Cherry's experiment really works. So, his task was like this, uh, the, there is this two year headphone that we talk about and so both the headphones actually go ahead the right, uh, the left headphone and the right headphone they hear soft and uh, um, uh, uh, hard tones, short and long tones, uh, long and short tones on both the ears. So, I have long tones and short tones which are being presented in both the ear and what people have to do is to shadow one of the ear in this case the left ear and to tell me aloud how many short tones or long tones would be was being presented. And the design of the ERP experiment generally most designs of ERP experiment in uh, works in this way. So, basically 
this is the time axis and this is the voltage axis the current axis of how much uh, potential is generated what is the amplitude of uh, the ERP waves uh, or what is the amplitude of the event related potential wave. So, basically we discuss in the first section that ERP is a method of doing uh, cognitive uh, uh, psychology and ERP uh, measures through sensors on the on the surface of, of the head uh, what kind of electric potential is generated. And so, after stimulus presentation. So, let us say that this is T equals to 0 where the stimulus is presented from here on uh, 1000 millisecond event or 1000 millisecond section was cut. So, EEGs were uh, recorded from different re, uh, regions of the brain. This EEG that I am talking about is from the auditory cortex since it is the auditory job and so this a number of trials. So, in ERPs what you have to do is you have to take a large number of trials and basically go ahead and uh, calculate something called uh, the mean of all these trials. So, a large number of uh, 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 trials are taken and are mixed together because um, human beings respond in different way there is a baseline uh, uh, this, uh, there is a baseline uh, waveform which is there and so these baseline forms may, may differ. So, to find out that unique signature that we are looking for in an ERP we have to take a number of trials. So, number of trials were taken and from these number of trials uh, ERP was cut from the moment the stimulus was initiated to 100 to 1000 millisecond or a response. So, 1000 millisecond was the response time which was given. So, within 1000 millisecond you have to go ahead and response whether it was a short tone and uh, long tone and what really happened. So, uh, when it was done it was found that an ERP like this was generated. Now, this ERP here is something called the N 1 and this ERP here is something called the P 1. Now, what is the N 1 and P 1? The N 1 is 100 milliseconds. So, the you see that the, uh, the potential this is the voltage axis and this is the time axis. So, what really happens is that you see a peak, a peak in voltage on the negative side. Now, amazingly, most ERPs are done in this way. So, the upside is generally negative and the bottom side is on the generally positive of, of my uh, graph. And so, what happens here is that attended years. So, this is the ERP of an attended year, this is the ERP of an unattended year. So, uh, the one which is thick is the ERP of an unattended year. And so, what is found is that in the attended year 80 milliseconds. So, this is basically 100 millisecond, but 80 milliseconds following the, uh, the onset of the stimulus I see a peak and this peak is called the N 1 peak. This happens this N 1 peak is basically uh, a peak which shows novelty. It is basically a peak which shows uh, new new things into the stimulus or it is it is basically an attentional peak. Most uh, books will talk about this as the attentional peak something which captures the attention something which is not present in, in the system. So, basically this 80 millisecond is the time which is required for a stimulus to basically come in and imprint on your uh, sense organ. So, when your attended year is waiting or when your attended year is actually uh, preparing itself within the first 80 millisecond a peak will, uh, will, will register a peak will be registered and this peak will demonstrate that it is attend the attended year the year which is being attended to uh, shows a brain response or shows a brain dynamics and this says that it is attended whereas on the attended year you do not see this peak. Similarly, you will find P 1 peak, P 3 peak and so on and so forth, but we will discuss those peaks somewhere else at some other point of time when we will be looking at what are ERPs and how are ERPs done. So, in the next coming lecture, upcoming lecture, we will continue with the automaticity, uh, the concept of automaticity of how automaticity really works, what are the factors which makes uh, attentional systems available and jobs automatic and how is attentional capacity allocated to different resources and we will also talk about something called the psychological refractory period which is a very interesting uh, th thing to look at. Thank you.